All right, so today we're doing cultural evolution. So you know here's an elephant that has acquired culture and is now drawing phylogenies. Right. <coughs> so what is culture? Transmission of information through generations. Mm -hmm. And is it vertical? And horizontal? Yeah, so it can be both. Right? So, I mean, you have DNA information transmitted from generations, right? But that's vertical. You know, but cultural evolution, the cultural transmission can happen vertically, you know. Your mother teaches, how, teaches you how to solder, and horizontally, you know, your cousin, you, you know, your friend teaches you how to solder. Okay. <coughs> how is it transmitted? We talked about that. And how is this different from what we've been talking about in general in this class? Mm-hmm. So it doesn't have like manipulative <coughs> Right. Yeah. Learning. Good. What else? It's not necessarily subject to natural selection. Some really strange cultural traits that can have a negative impact on culture. Okay, like what? Uh, the belief in witchcraft kind of led to the bubonic plague being spread as rampantly as it was because they blamed the cats and got rid of all the cats and the mice population and pigs and spread the plague. The leaves were like really strong. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, can you think of any non human examples? <coughs> I mean, that's a good example. Are there any non-human examples of culture as we doing being disadvantageous? Well, polar bears and penguins chose to live in the like most extreme places on Earth, in a sense. Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, polar bears could choose to move south, right? I mean, they're connected to the Canadian mainland, right? So, but are they kept in the north by cultural reasons or just sort of um, because my, my mother always lived in the north, I live in the north too, or is it um, <coughs> some sort of in instinct, which is distinct from culture, or like evolve preference for cold? Um, that's a question. I mean, with polar bears at least, I mean, they, the way they hunt their food is typically on, on sea ice, so you need to stay up there. Um, but yeah, you can imagine some of things where um, dispersal is based on sort of learning. So in the Amazon, there are birds that won't cross rivers. And so you have, you know, speciation across the river boundary where the bird can easily fly across the river, but it just doesn't. Um, and again, whether that's culture, you know, my family, we don't fly across rivers, or whether it's based on, you know, some sort of instinctual thing where birds that do fly across rivers tend to get hit, hit by hawks, and so that trait's been bred out of them. Good question. Good. Other thoughts about this? Also, before we... Going. We have a midterm due today. Are people finished? Any questions? Okay. I had one email over the weekend about uh, how much should we cite. Say as much as you're comfortable with. If you're like an in-class midterm, I'm not going to ding you for not citing unless you so unless you like lift a passage out of somewhere else, which is you know copying and cheating and plagiarism. Um, citing saves you a little bit, but you, know, you should just be lifting sections out of like Wikipedia. Um, but in general, you don't need to cite the lectures or anything like that. You know. I also don't want to dissuade you from citing. If you, if you have the habit of citing, don't you know, try to break that habit for this class. You know, citing is good. But don't, don't stress about it for the test. Yeah? Um, this is not related to the midterm, so. Okay. Any, any midterm <coughs> questions? Okay. Um, is it possible for animals other than humans to have culture? Ah, good. We'll see in a minute. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so here's a very cool study that came out a couple of years ago about human cultural evolution. Okay. And here is um, so people spread from across Austronesia. Okay. And basically, you have all these different islands, people settling from island to island. Okay. 
Um, and here, culture is mostly vertically transmitted, right? So there could be, you, know, you could adopt a culture from you know, visiting a neighboring island and say, hey, you like your social structure. And here, the, the trait is social structures, ranging from you know, acephalous, so having just you know, individual family groups, you know, like structure, to having a simple chiefdom, to having a complex chiefdom, to having a, a state structure set up, right? And so you can see on the map, on the phylogeny, how this is mapped on. Basically, you can do a reconstruction of how cultures change and found that, you know, they can take one step. You don't go from acephalus directly to a state. You know, you move up this way. But occasionally, you can go from a state and follow it back to acephalus. Okay. So here's an example of how human culture can evolve. Okay. Um, and there are many other examples of human culture evolving. Any questions about this? Okay. So let's compare evolution by selection versus cultural change. I suppose we have a population monomorphic for blue, <coughs> and then someone evolves red, and then at some point we get down to all red. Okay? And how does this happen? Well, this happens from the red ones having more surviving offspring than the blue ones do. Right, so it takes a while. Right? If the trait were really adaptive, it would spread quickly. If blue were really not selected again, so will it go extinct? Right? If blue would like, you know, have no offspring, that trait would disappear very quickly, or like a fatal mutation. But this spreads fairly quickly through the population. Right? Cultural change. How do we get to monomorphic red? <coughs> well, you can, you can have someone adopt red. And then others say, hey, red is cool, right? And it can spread very, very quickly. Right? So cultural change can spread much faster than evolutionary change. Oh, sorry. Right. Nine different chimp tool behaviors have been with nine different chimp tool that? behaviors have been with. Nine different chimp tool behaviors have been witnessed. Here's culture in the twigs to fish with termites out of their mouths. Sticks as probes to get into a tree ant nest or inspect an object. Rocks as hammers to open fruit. And use leaves as a sponge to soak up water to drink. They flail sticks and throw rocks as weapons to intimidate other animals. Or, or even use sharp sticks as spears. That's how you use a spear. They'll, They'll even, even use vines and sticks to play tug of war or, or keep away with. with. Okay, so there we see tool use in chimps. Right, so they can use tools. But it doesn't seem saying they have culture. Right, why not? Right, so it's the learning and teaching aspect of culture that's important. And so actually what we see from chimps is that you know, some chimp groups will do this fishing with termites, some won't. Some will use, some will first strip the bark off the twigs, some won't. Okay. Um, and so some, some chimp groups will use leaves, actually they'll crunch leaves to do a signal of like, I want to mate. So some groups will do the same signal, but it means, you know, back off buddy, I'm going to fight you. Okay. Um, and so you have these cultural divergences, and the chimps within a group learn, you know, the current usage of like, oh, every, all the cool kids are you know, using using barkless sticks to get termites, right? I'm going to do that. But another group won't do that at all. Okay. So there's evidence that there is this cultural learning that happens. Okay. <coughs> now, when thinking about something complex like culture, it's always also good to think about like potential alternate explanations, right? So let's say we have, you know, these six chimp groups, and these use sticks, and these don't, okay? <coughs> What's a non-cultural explanation for this? 
Mm -hmm. So maybe these live in areas where they're termites, and these don't. So it's a good environmental thing. So they all have this innate ability, at least some express it. Right, what's, another, what's another possibility? Mm -hmm. Yep. There's no twigs, so you can't do anything. What else? One well, possibility could be it's not horizontally transmitted, it's only vertically transmitted. Right? So maybe this <coughs> lineage of chimps evolved the ability to do this. And they just happen to be, you know, arranged not well not in one geographic area, right? But different groups. Right, so to see if it's whether it's cultural evolution or not, you have to look at these possible other explanations. Right. So genetics or environmental. Okay. What are the ways to get at that, to answer that question? Mm -hmm. So you take away their sticks, and then what, what, so they be, they're angry, and then they do so something. If they were similar to the, if they behave similarly to the chips that did not have sticks, I guess uh, that would mean that they're just not vertically transmitted. That's so. Mm -hmm. you know, can they learn, right? So you could move them over to a different group and say, hey, learn. See what they do. Yep, that's good. What else? How do you get this, rule out this explanation? Yep, so you can make a tree and infer whether they're related or not. And if these are a clade, then you have just sort of, now you have N of 1, right? It could have happened just once and then be, you know, a genetic trait. It's an instinctual thing. Right. What if you also look at their geographic location and proximity to each other? Because maybe those groups aren't related to each other, but they live near each other and they might observe each other. Mm -hmm. So one group origin and the other one's observed it. Oh, well, we'll do the same thing. Yep. But the other ones don't move close enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see how, how the trait may spread. Good. Okay. Questions about this example? Here's another example of culture and learning. <laughs> What's this whale doing? <laughs> Suffering from stomach pain. A male humpback Singing. whale right. sings to attract a mate. Thank you. So, <clears throat> lots of things can sing, but they can sing instinctually, right? So they can just, you know, I can take a bird and raise it somewhere, and when it gets to be a bit adult, it might start singing, right? So singing alone does not show culture. Um, so why, why may this be culture? Um, isn't it like whales in the same pod can like teach the same song to other mm -hmm. whales and like that, that population will kind of all sing the same song yep. together? Yep, they all sing related songs, yeah. And it changes every year. Yeah. Like one year it's Macarena, one year it's YMCA, mm -hmm. they keep changing, mm -hmm. right? So this ends my, my pop culture knowledge. Um, Right, but they, they learn from others, right? And it changes the style through, through time. Okay. So social learning is important in cultures. How do things do social learning? Okay. So here are various strategies that can be used for social learning. So we just go through it. A male humpback 
whale sings to attract a mate. The, the whales have just returned to their breeding grounds in the shallow seas of the tropics. jumping off a bridge, would you do it too? Well, if, it's, if it's the majority, sure. Right, so I mean, there's a cost of social learning, right? So if you're doing well enough already, right, copying someone else, they might be doing less well than you, right? So if I know how to break open rock, break open nuts, and they don't, they sort of throw nuts into the river, you know, I can start taking that strategy instead of just throwing nuts into the river, right? And I'm not going to have any more nuts to eat. Okay, so they should copy me, but I shouldn't copy them. But how do I know when they have a different strategy for something else? But I should copy them then, right? And so all of this work with social strategies is figuring out, you know, when should you start copying? So if you're not doing well, start copying because you're someone else is doing better, right? Um, if you you know if you're dissatisfied. Um, Copy those that are older, maybe they've survived better. Right? Maybe they have more time to get experience in how to crack nuts efficiently. Okay. Um, what does this mean? Copy and asocial learning is costly. Like if you don't go along with the group, um, it's less beneficial to you. Like if you have the biggest school of fish and one doesn't follow the group, it gets more um, That's a good explanation for when to copy. That's not what they're going with that one. That, that's something that's not on the list, actually. It's good. So what, yeah, so what does that one mean? <coughs> so what's a social learner? Learning on your own. Exactly. Yeah. And then like, it would take you longer to figure it out. You can just follow the group. Mm -hmm. Right. Or it could be cost, you know, so there's both the time element, also going to be issues of danger, right? If, I, if I'm learning how to catch and eat a scorpion, right? That's really costly for a while until I get the hang of it. If I can follow someone else and figure out how they, oh, they grab the pin, they grab the telson. Okay, I'll grab the telson. Yeah. Um, that's another example of that. Good. Okay. And how people actually study this is the first, there'll be behavioral studies, and they'll watch things in the nature and see. You know, when does, you know, ape 315 copy ape, you know, beta? Okay, you see, you know, that sort of thing. But also people actually run experiments where they'll program robots, or computers programs, with different social strategies. They say, okay. This is the same way we talked about with the um, uh, game theory, looking at the hawk versus dove. Right? You can see which one will win. In the same sort of game here, we can say, okay, here we have some complex thing, you know, um, a typical scenario might be pulling levers, and some levers give you food, some levers don't. How do you know which levers to pull? You can try pulling levers yourself, or you can watch someone else pulling levers and learn from them. Okay? And which strategy do you use? So you can program a variety of different strategies and then see which ones are advantageous. You can change the conditions, you know, how often do levers change, and that sort of thing, and see how, that how you know, learning strategies differ in terms of, in terms of fitness. So how does learning happen? Okay. So one stimulus enhancement, right? See the whole 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 world of plants out there, but Larry's going to this one plant, right? Why is he messing with that plant so much, right? And so you can go and sort of focus your attention on something. Why is that rock so interesting? Well, it has a turtle inside it. It's actually a shell, right? So that's sort of learning. There's imitation. Right? 
So, if, you know, you see someone, someone, you know, another group member messing with something, you do the same thing. And finally, you also see this sometimes, too. So, teaching. Right? So, a uh, leopard might catch, catch some prey animal, not quite kill it, and let its offspring go and, you know, try to get it. Right? Um, same sort of thing with uh, orcas and seals. Sometimes they'll get a seal and sort of hit it in the air and then let their, their younger orcas try to catch it. Questions about this? Okay, here are some examples of learning and culture, okay? And how it happened. So how they did it, what the behavioral pattern was, okay, and what they did. So social learning, okay, um, in those cases. Right. Was there a noteworthy I'm not sure. I mean, there's, I mean, famous cases of like, you know, like, do we have parental care in various groups of herp herps, right? And so we know that like, some dinosaurs have parental care. It's like, myosaur was on our list of taxa, right? Because like, oh, we have these eggs and they, they were to be cared for by adults. Um, so it's cases like that. I'm thinking about, I mean, there's, there's, you know, the kids further back in time of things, you know, choosing to keep eggs inside a shell rather than broadcast them to the environment, sort of parental care. Um, and it does evolve many times. So, you know, some frogs will just, you know, lay eggs and go off. And some tree frogs actually drop an egg into a bromeliad and then periodically every couple days come back and drop another egg in there for the first tadpole to now eat. And so like sort of a way of you know, provisioning your offspring. So that thing sort of still what happens. Um, you know, in fish, there's many been re-evolutions re of parental care. Yeah, but in terms of like the first parental care, I'm not sure. Um, maybe something worth checking out, yeah. But it does seem to be a pretty labile trait, so it changes frequently, which can also erase history. And it keeps looking on and off, on and off, on and off. You know, by the time you get down to the roots, there's been 50 changes. It's hard to know whether the roots are in state zero or state one. Is there fossil evidence that could help, though? Good question. Okay. So here we see investigation of uh, cultural culture in some fish. Okay. So there are these fish that will breed above certain high areas on the reef. Okay. And every day they'll go and mate there. Okay. And there are other areas that are also prominent where they don't mate. And so what makes these the hot hookup locations and not these? Right, is a question. <coughs> and it could be there's something really good about that spot that scientists just don't, just don't notice. Right? Maybe the water is a little bit warmer there. Maybe the light's better for display. Or maybe it's just that that's where they've always done it and so this tradition has been passed on. So how do you test this? Yeah, so you try to you know, do this sort of analytical scientific approach of break it down and say, okay, what actual things are they queuing in on? Good. That's one way of doing it. What's another way of doing it? You could remove the population of this species from this group mm -hmm. and reintroduce it later. Or reintroduce and then breed them and reintroduce the young that wouldn't have had the chance to learn. Mm-hmm. Do that. It's another way of doing it. Well, we actually did what you said. So, well, basically what you just said. 
So they would go, and these fish apparently are very easy to catch with, you just bait a net with some sea urchins, and after a couple days they can catch all the fish in the area of the species. And so what they'll do is catch all the fish, and then being you know, a nice scientist, they move to another reef somewhere far away, and they don't come back, and they know this from recapture studies rather than just eating them. Um, and later they'll move other fish back, a uh, uh, fish from somewhere else, to this reef. And they know from mark recapture studies that these fish won't leave the reef once they've been put there. So you can move them over here and they'll stay here. Um, and so they do experimental and controls. They say, okay, so in this area there are 43 potential sites, we think. Right? And it's based on scientists saying, yeah, that looks high enough for them to really like it. How many sites are being used for mating? Six, okay, or seven. And they look at this across six different sites. And they have an experimental treatment and a control treatment. What would be the control treatment be? <coughs> mm -hmm. So you catch them all and then bring them back. Right? And, and why don't you just leave them there? Why you actually go through the effort of catching them? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And if they get traumatized by this and go to like suboptimal sites, you don't want them to. You want to be able to check that, right? So then, see which sites were used before, see how many sites were used after, and then look at the overlap, right? So here they had 12 mating sites. After reintroducing, they have 12. And it's the same 12. Here they had six. And they come back. They have the new one has have seven, and now they have only two in common. So what does this tell you? Mm-hmm. Yep. And the experimental. So the experimental ones, it's a different group of fish. Yeah, the different group of fish they have. It's also a new different one, right? Yep. Interesting question. So, um, the author interpreted this as they just sort of pick randomly among the available sites, and then have a traditional tr a family tradition after that. But a different way to look at it is they have they do have criteria. It's not picking at random. The criteria differ between different places. So that's something that something they, they didn't consider. So did they capture, like, say C one mm -hmm. and E one? Is that the same population capture? No, no, no. They're, they're different. The six different populations. Yeah. So I think the next test would be to take one gigantic population, <coughs> take half and put them back, and the other half put elsewhere, and then see if there's. You could take these populations and randomly select them the same for the same population to test them out. I don't think that might be right. They could get at her hypothesis of, you know, you could take the same population, take like you know, two different groups, and then put them on, the, put like, you know, one group on the reef, see which sites they pick, see picture buff, the next group on the reef, and see if they pick the same sites, or they pick at random among the sites. Which would be like that question. Yeah. 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 But the main point of their study, and the reason it got into a fairly good journal, was that, like, there's strong evidence of this social learning, like, they, they keep at the same site year after year, but because it's somehow optimal, because that's where everyone's always gone. And they go to these new sites, and they go to the a mating site every day. As long as they stay, stay there their entire lives, they go back to this, you know, mating spot and then go back to this foliage. Okay. Any questions about this? You said they meet at the same spot to mate every day. I feel like a predator would pick up on that pretty easily. Yeah. I'm not sure how many sea urchins, but and it, it could have been like a fishing net, not like a butterfly net. But what if, like, um, like a population of sea otters figures that out? Like, you can just plant a couple sea urchins over there. 
There they all are. Yep. Seems it's like a pretty major flaw in there. Most of life is extinct, you know. <laughs> um, extinct for a reason. Yeah, I mean, we, we do see things like that where, you know, a new thing evolves, a new, a new strategy, and then can wipe out lots of things. So it's possible that that could happen here, right? It hasn't happened yet. And another thing is that within every population, there's usually variation, right? So, you know, here there didn't seem to be variation, maybe across the entire species, maybe there's some that really hate sea urchins. Maybe, you know, there'll be a few that escape and then rebuild the population, but maybe not, they'll just go extinct. Yeah, extinction happens. <laughs> Um, is culture the same as learning? I'm probably this is a semantic issue, but this is, I mean, the deeper things in the semantics, right? So you say um, no. I think culture requires transmission and prolonged transmission. Right. Learning can just be easy. Mm -hmm. Learning can just learn, learn on your own. It can be asocial learning. It's still learning. And here's a very cool example of different cultures in one species, too. So we can assess that. All right, so what's happening here? What was reaching themselves to catch seals? Yes, we have amphibious whales. Right? And this is just, you know, one pod in South America has learned this trick. They're like, look, I'll be an amphibian. Like, you know, and go up on the beach and get things. Yeah. I thought their strategy was to go a lot faster and shoot up on the beach and scare them into the water so the other orcas would eat them. It could, I, I, it could, be, it could be that same pod. It could be a different pod. I don't, I don't know that example. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Is there a high frequency of them not being in the water? No. And what they do is when they're young, they train like getting a shallow ground and, and learning. Yeah. You think like, yeah, this is a case where learning is costly. Like, oh, wait, I went to high rocks. I can't get back. Yeah. Learning fails. Um, <coughs> so yeah, so here's a case where you definitely want social learning. Yeah. Here, these orcas eat fish. Okay. So orcas have these distinct groups. And, you know, some eat fish, some eat marine mammals. So here's some... Um, hunting a gray whale in California. <coughs> um, and you see these differences. And so the seal eaters, the, 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 the fish eaters, won't eat you know, seals. They won't eat whales. Okay. And so they differ radically in what they do and how they hunt, right, for the same species. Okay. And so here's a case of one species with multiple cultures. And one cool thing is that there's some Patrick too. So what does that mean again? And the same two representations. Exactly. <coughs> so why is that important? Because they have three different evolved hunting styles. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and we know it's, it's cultural rather than, I mean, it could just be that, you know, where these ones live, there are only fish. Where these ones live, there are only big whales, right? So the fact that they co-occur is just that they have opportunities to eat other things. But they just choose not to. Okay. Right. And it could be a preference in that, like, they think, you know, fish are yummy, but more likely is that they've, you know, these have learned how to catch fish successfully, and they wouldn't know what to do with a whale, and vice versa. Okay. So it's cool. It's cool to see, like, you know, this trait as well. I mean, and this has been originally just a couple workers did this, and now the pod, whole pod does this. This is this trait that's spreading. And so, you know, we can go to this trait spreading through work and start, you know, getting sunbathers in California, you know, something like that. There's like a certain elegance when you see a whale catch something in the water, you know, it's fast <coughs> and graceful and catches it. Watching a killer whale catch a seal on the beach is just an ugly. <laughs> the seals can't really run on the beach very well, the orca can't do it very well. <laughs> 
But given enough time, you'd have really, really fast seals and really fast running orcas, right? And evolution can conquer all. <coughs> okay. So related ideas are plasticity and maternal effects. We might talk about these later in the semester, but I just want to talk about it a little bit now because it relates to this. So what's plasticity? Mm -hmm. In what way? So evolution is changeability, right? So plasticity is a different sense of plus of changeability. Plasticity is more manipulative than Yep, exactly. And so in response to environmental cues, it can drill differently. Right? Um, <coughs> and then we have to distinguish sort of evolutionary trends, things like Bergman's rule, you know, things going north get bigger and cuter, shorter ears and things like that. That could be, you know, evolution, you adapt to colder temperatures, or could, and so those that, you know, are smaller do, do less well and have fewer offspring, because it would be plasticity. If you grow up in a cold area, develop this morphology, right? Um, you know, think about domestic pigs versus wild hogs, right? Same genetic stock, but very different, you know, phenotypic outcomes as a result of plasticity, not selection. How does that relate to cultural evolution? Yeah, so plasticity is a is a based on genetic factor, you know, genetic architecture. Right. It's it's environmental change, but the mechanism for it is genetic, not learning. Yeah. So you can imagine you could have cultural plasticity. An area where there's termites, you know, fish for them, if not, don't. Right, but the typical plasticity is genetically based. What else? How <coughs> how are they similar? Plasticity generally can't. <clears throat> yeah, it's more like, you know, like if you grow up in a cold area and your twin grows up in a warm area, you develop differently because of plasticity. Um, but if your, you know, twin's friend from the warm area comes to your cold area, they're not going to, they're not going to learn from you how to adapt to the cold. Either, you know, do it themselves or don't. Well, in some ways, both both sort of both buffer things from natural selection, right? So you can think about you know how natural selection works, and if you're in a cold area, you know maybe it's better to have smaller ears, but you get less less up to get frostbite, right? And so um, selection can act on that trait directly if it's always expressed. If it's only expressed when it's cold, not when it's warm, right? Selection doesn't always happen. Okay. Um, the same with cultural evolution. Right. Um, if I can just learn how to survive based on what my neighbors are doing, right? Natural selection can act on genetic factors as much as acting on cultural ideas, <coughs> right? <coughs> and so it sort of evens out selection across various genotypes through this plasticity or this flexibility. Okay. What are maternal effects? Your mother was a hoarder, so you're a hoarder. So there are non genetic factors, um, that influences their mother passes on to offspring. Right? So if the mother lives in an area that has um, high density of, you know, other aphid adults, right? Then her offspring could be produced in 
you know, um, have wings rather than be asexual because of this maternal effect of, you know, it's not a genetic thing, it's just the mother uh, has factors that res result in the offspring of all, uh, growing up differently. Okay, we'll see the same thing if you have plants from a dry area, right? Their offspring, the first generation, will be dry adapted, right? Even though the, even the species as a whole has a whole range of phenotypes that could adopt, right? But if I then plant them in a wet area year after year, they will, you know, even without natural selection, they will um, have the wet phenotype, okay? So first the mother sort of, you know, gives an input based on her own environment to the offspring and how they will develop. Which is why in the common garden experiments, they'll first do a generation of just, or just reproduction before they have the actual experiment they're doing. Because they want to erase this maternal effect. Okay, this, of the mother sort of skewing the offspring one way or another based on her own environment. You said that's not genetic? No. I mean, it, I mean, the abilities that lead to it are genetic, but it's not the mother is passing on different DNA to the offspring, so they'll develop differently. Okay, how is it passed? Um, <coughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, and it, 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 I mean, it, it's not like one single way. It, it varies across things. Um, yeah, I mean, there's related things with like methylation and DNA and humans. We'll get to that later. Other questions? Okay. So 